interesting talk. <laughs> Um, mainly, be, well, interesting for a few reasons. One, the question and the tools used are interesting. Two, uh, due to weird scheduling, I forgot that I had sch <laughs> scheduled this and my fourth exam on Monday. So coherency will be fun. All right. So anyway, let's talk about congruent numbers for the moment. Um, so. In case you haven't heard of a congruent number, it's it's any natural number in which it is produced it is the area of a right triangle with rational sides. So with a three, four, five triangle, we have area six. Cool, easy enough. So six is a congruent number. Um, just to verify, Everyone in the actual room can hear me, right? Yes. Okay. Just, par there. just paranoia. <laughs> All right. So another example, which if you play with numbers long enough, you'll find out five is a uh, congruent number. Alternatively, you do what I did and go to Wikipedia and find out why. Okay. I did not really feel like playing with that number too much. Uh, for sanity's sake, which I think is only for one slide, um, I'm going to assume that capital X and Y are going to be the legs of a right triangle and the hypotenuse is Z. All right. So the congruent number problem is now just, if I am given a natural number, is it a congruent number? Um, and you could just, play with a bunch of rational numbers and hope for the best, but that seems like a very poor life choice and not very interesting because that's even worse than brute force. Um, but there are some classical results, which I snagged from Wikipedia because I'm not as familiar with the classical results, where if I have a prime number P and P is congruent to three mod eight. Well, P is not congruent, but two times P is. And, you know, if P's uh, congruent to five, but that's not very, there's a lot of numbers it misses. So there are other results um, as well, but g using more classical methods, um, you're not getting a very quick answer. But in the 1980s, um, Tunnel uh, de devised a, a partial resolution. And the reason it's a partial resolution is because it, and there's the first typo of the day. Uh, yeah, it should be Birch and Swinner 10 Dyer. Uh, so Swinnerton, Dyer should be hyphenated in the end should be fair. You know. uh, English is commutative, by the way. That's the most important life fact. But you, but Tunnel relies on that, which is a million dollar question. So if you want a million dollars, go prove it in the positive and make a lot of number theorists happy. All right. Um, and if you know about BSD, then you also know that, well, Obviously, if you're using BSD, then it involves elliptic curves and modular forms. If you don't know BSD, then we'll find out a little bit about these objects. Um, and these objects can get very technical, which is why this is going to be a very um, introductory talk of like, here's some tools you can use. And if you're very interested, then go read more in depth because there's no good way. Um, I'm going to state what Tunnel's theorem says to kind of give you an idea of why this is a nicer result than what we had um, with the classicals. Um, so if I have a square free odd positive integer and n is in fact the area of a right triangle, then this equality holds. That's a very 
strange looking quality, but we'll mention kind of what that means in a second. Um, ignoring the middle part is for even numbers. And if BSD is true, then second type over there. If the um, if BSD is true, this equality holding implies that n is a congruent number. So the first direction is free, doesn't rely on BSD at all. The second direction is where BSD is necessary. Um, so this gives you a very algorithmic way to check if you, n is in fact a congruent number, assuming BSD. We'll see what BSD is in a little bit. Um, anyway, so let's talk about ellipt ellipt elliptic curves because the, that weird equality were the points on an elliptic curve. So I scroll the wrong way. So question of the day, can my mouse be seen? Yes. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah, I did not think this through because, you know, how do you talk about addition on elliptic curves anyway without a mouse working? So elliptic curves can be represented in the form of y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. And ax, uh, a, b are just some values in, say, q. If you want to work with different fields, that's fine. But for today, we'll just deal with q. So if I want to add two points together, say P1 and P2, I will draw, we draw the line that intersects P1, P2. And by Bazou's theorem, it will intersect at third point. Uh, and that third point may not be distinct, it, or it could be at infinity, uh, but not getting to that right now. So it intersects at third point, but P3 is not going to be our addition law. Rather, we're going to reflect it across the uh, x-axis, which gives us P4. Uh, so P1 plus P2 is P4 down here. Right. And under that addition law, that is going to give us a billion group. And I think I reordered the slides to not say that yet. OK. So let's talk about the elliptic curve we care about at the moment before I give you more properties. Yeah. So if I have a right triangle, so going back to the congruent number question, with x, y, and z as my sides, um, z is a, a hypotenuse again, and has area n, I can define lowercase x and y in this way. Um, and it will turn out that these two points are going to be points on this elliptic curve. So I, I will let you check the arithmetic. I, don't think it's enlightening to show the uh, arithmetic since um, my typing skills clearly say can convince me that I can do a lot of magical things or incorrect things. So, so I know if I have a right triangle that has that area in, it's a rational point on the elliptic curve, but the, the issue is, okay, well, if I have, if I take that elliptic curve for this particular n value and I find a rational point, does that mean that corresponds to a rational triangle? Couldn't I just kind of work these formulas backwards? And that the converse won't hold. Um, so specifically, uh, one of the issues is the x is squared and that can cause issues. So no, no such luck uh, doing it that way. All right. So, yeah, four directions fine. All right, back to elliptic curves in general. All right, should talk slower. Okay, so the uh, like I said, the addition law forms a a billion group, and Specifically, we want to talk about rational points. So we'll denote that with E of Q. And if I want to talk about the 
uh, rational points that have finite order, then we denote as tors for the uh, torsion subgroup. Okay. And we can decompose uh, the rational points uh, group into this finite subgroup and the infinite part. So depending on how much algebra you've seen, that's either completely obvious or not. Um, so, but that's fairly standard. Uh, the more interesting part is this bit from Mazur, which tells us that if an elliptic curve, uh, if I have an elliptic curve, the torsion subgroup is actually going to be one of these 15 subgroups. So either it's the cyclic uh, subgroup for 1 through n and then 12, or this cross um, product, so with m ranging from 1 to 4. Now for our elliptic curve, well, the family of elliptic curves really, um, it turns out that the torsion subgroup is gonna be of size four. Um, for sanity and various other reasons, I'm not gonna improve that. Uh, Cause you, know, you can read through the proof and it makes perfect sense, or you can see me explain it and wonder why I'm explain something obvious or wonder why I'm explaining something that you need more details for. There's no winning. But because we know it's a torsion uh, has size four, it's either uh, Z uh, mod four Z or it's Z two, well, it's either that or the time four group. Okay, so two possibilities. Uh, Repeat that for a reason. Okay, yeah. So the part that we care about now is, okay, if I have a torsion subgroup of, you know, with the finite points, and I know there's only four finite points, and we can guess which of the, we, we have narrowed down to two subgroups. What does that tell us about the congruent numbers? Because this, this subgroup size doesn't depend on whether n is a congruent number. Um, not every integer is going to be, well, every natural number isn't a congruent number. So kind of what is a torsion subgroup versus the other portion of it? And it turns out that n is a congruent number. I'm not sure what that was. <laughs> Uh, it is a congruent number if and only if the uh, set of rational points on the elliptic curve has non-zero rank. Um, so not explicitly what rank was, but oh, is yes. rank being the infinite portion. So for some of these subgroups, for many of these subgroups, the ones that aren't rational, it just has those four elements on the curve and the rest of this is just not there. So if I can, if we can figure out the rank, then we're good to go and we're very excited. Okay. So to get at the rank, unfortunately, we have to go to these other objects being modular forms. Um, so very briefly, um, elliptic curves are very nice and algebraic and modular forms, depending on your feelings on analysis, specifically, I guess, complex analysis. I have no idea what weird typing error happened there. Okay, so I'll tell you all that in a second. Um, but depending on your feelings of analysis, uh, will greatly determine uh, if you like modular forms or not, because they're completely analytic structures, um, which also, like I mentioned, kind of muddles how well this can be explained in 
completely an informal talk on this. So a function is called weekly modular, provided I have a group in SL2Z. Uh, so that's the group of two by two matrices with determinant one. Uh, it's going to map the upper half plane into the complex numbers. So upper half plane uh, is crap would have been handy. It's literally if you take the complex numbers, which is the plane, everything above the x axis. Okay, so this weird typing error. Um, that's pretty impressive. Uh, this should be C Z plus D, which is why I'm really perplexed where a underscore came into play. Uh, so that's why I'm impressed by that. Uh, this is a fairly common group action, by the way, if you're taking uh, algebra 851 or the undergrad that might appear. Uh, incidentally, every time I've taken uh, graduate algebra, which I have multiple masters, so don't ask. Um, it's always a homework problem because everybody's, you know, yeah, as soon as I said that, um, someone in the comments pointed out how I found the underscore. But anyway, uh, so that's a lovely group action. If you are lucky you'll have a number of theorists teaching you algebra and you'll have that probably as a homework problem. Okay, so this function will map to uh, CZ plus D raised to the K times FZ. And that's gonna be for every matrix in that uh, group. Okay. And it turns out that a weekly modular function is gonna be um, periodic well, one periodic, and it satisfies this uh, property as well. Uh, that's not too bad to see, but uh, just some lovely properties of it. So what's a modular form now? A modular form of weight K will be something that's weakly modular. And when we say holomorphic for everybody's sanity, just go, okay, this is differentiable in some by some definition for complex numbers. So, so I can differentiate on the half plane and I can differentiate at infinity. For purposes of life, let's not ask how we differentiate at infinity since it's not relevant for the talk at the moment. Okay. That is a very strange uh, sentence to say, though. All right. Yeah. OK, so if we, so the elliptic curves and modular forms, the reason we have both of them and we're talking about both of them is because they're linked together. Um, I'm going to read this slightly out of order, mainly because uh, so, trying to think how I want to say this. All right, so modular forms and elliptic curves were basically assumed to be completely related uh, in the 80s, and I think even in the 70s. Actually, I think all the way back to the 50s, to be honest. But uh, there wasn't a great, like, you know, there was obviously some correlation between the two. Uh, and essentially what Andrew Wiles proved when he proved Fermat's last theorem, well, in quotes proved Fermat's last theorem, was actually proving the modularity of elliptic curves, which says that in short, every elliptic curve corresponds to some modular form, which are actually new forms. So that's essentially what that is. And so if I, if I have these elliptic curves and these uh, modular forms that are related, their L functions are going to be related. So 
that gives us a nice relation. Uh, now, how you actually compute the L functions isn't quite of interest at the moment. Um, for elliptic curves, it really doesn't uh, matter for us today. And in terms of modular forms, all that we're going to really care about is a modular form can be written out in a Fourier series. Um, and in that Fourier series, we're able to take those coefficients and the L function is just going to be the coefficient times n raised to the uh, ne negative s, which possibly looks somewhat familiar to, um, can't speak, Riemann hypothesis, the Riemann zeta function should look vaguely similar to that. All right. Uh, so that's in general, very roughly speaking, what we care about. What we really care about is just that this equality holds. All right. Yeah. Uh, just to placate some questions, uh, this S right here, I, I said that it's a new form and well, a new form it just means that it's a modular form that we have from an elliptic curve. And the reason we have S rather than say M, M seems like a reasonable thing for modular forms. S just means it's a cusp form, which has um, the leading coefficient, the zeroth term as well, zero. Uh, so the reason for S and so C is because, well, German. That's the answer of the day. All right, so why do we care about L functions in this other than yeah, it links modular forms and elliptic curves? Well, if I have an elliptic curve with, and this is the BSD uh, conjecture, I, the weak version of it, I, I can't remember if the weak version is the one that will get you a million dollars. Um, it will certainly get you a job somewhere. So uh, prove it nonetheless. Okay, so if I have an elliptic curve and the elliptic curve has infinitely many rational points, so if it has infinitely many rational points, the rank is, well, non-zero. And that is conjectured to only occur um, if and only if the L function evaluated that elliptic curve with s equal to one is zero. Okay, reasonable enough. So, okay, sweet, I actually tied it back, good. Okay, so if I have that, then all I need to do is figure out how to compute the L function of E at one. Well, the problem there is I would have to do that for every single um, N and that gets a little annoying. But the other issue is I also need a good way to compute rank and computing rank kind of, well, sucks. Um, there's packet, uh, you can certainly do this in Magma or Sage, but it's usually very uh, computationally based. So might be some problems, but with the modularity of elliptic curves, I could just compute it using um, f f of z, the, the module, the new form, of, uh, uh, correlated to it. And remember, the modular form correlated to that was defined in terms of the coefficients of that modular form. So if I can figure out these coefficients, that should be easy. Okay, that still sounds like a very hard question. Luckily we have a uh, Strom's theorem, uh, which Strom's theorem is essentially uh, just a complex number, uh, complex uh, analysis type uh, theorem for vanishing. So if I have um, a subset of a congruence uh, subgroup in SL2Z and 
I have a modular form, doesn't matter what kind of modular form it is, a weight k. All I need to do is check the first mk over 12 entry, well, terms, so those coefficients. And if those are zero, then the entire modular form is zero. So that becomes very easy to now check to see if the L functions can be zero for a given modular form. Because now I only have to check, hopefully, just the first uh, MK over 12 terms. So, all right. And now we unfortunately get to the parts where I'm going to just show you theorems. And, well, I've been showing you theorems. Um, showing you theorems that one, I wasn't confident could be typed into uh, the into Beamer and get them to fit on one slide today. Because some of the ones that usually fit on one slide did not want to. And they are quite lengthy. Um, and these are also go beyond the hope of, you know, a nice. Uh, informal talk. So the first one is Shamor correspondence. So I, I'm going to kind of outline the general idea of what these proofs are going to, like these, how you would use these theorems to get your desired result. Um, but basically, at the moment, the key idea is um, I have an elliptic curve, uh, e to the n, we figured out that if it has a rational uh, point, we, we want to have a rational point that has, say, infinite order. So the rank is non zero. And that correlates to the L function of a uh, new form. And the new forms, we can uh, compute those L functions to see if they're zero in a fairly decent systematic way. Um, oh, and to give you some idea, I think. You, you don't even need to check. If you just want to run this constantly with like, you know, I think MK over 12 equals like 30, you know, like just check the first 30 terms, that's going to be overkill. So those numbers aren't very large. Um, but in this, we're going to, so for Shamor's correspondence, we have a half weight uh, cusp form, uh, well, half Aaron Gold weight. And dear slate characters. Uh, but the idea is I can take this half weight integral form and I can move it to a modular form of integer weight. And the reason that's going to be key is because the uh, modular forms that you actually get that you're going to be um, using initially in a tunnel theorem are going to be half integer weight. So you have to take the half integer weight forms, move them to something useful with Shamor's correspondence. Uh, and just brief history. Uh, Shamor and uh, Tanya, I believe that's how you say the other name. Uh, those two are actually the ones who uh, conjecture the modularity elliptic curves. So. I think uh, Shamor, assuming he's still alive, I think he's at Princeton. I'm not, my knowledge of ages are very skewed at the moment. Uh, and Walter J's theorem uh, is kind of what ties this all to ultimately together, um, which relies on this lovely inequality, inequality uh, lovely equality. And this equality is essentially what gives us that weird um, tunnels theorem. Uh, you know, this size equals to this size. Um, and it relies on this. And it's a cool result. But like I said, there's no <laughs> nice way to say that. Um, the, 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 the most aggravating thing about this is if you read uh, Koblitz's book, um, where uh, Koblitz uh, has a book called Introduction to Elliptic Curves and Modular Forms, 
And the goal of that book is to give you all the tools necessary to fully prove Tunnel's theorem. Um, and his last section is like some more correspondence, Walsh per J, and I think some other theorems. And he doesn't bother to state Walsh per J's theorem in a book with the purpose of proving Tunnel's theorem. So, um, yeah. So, there's the theorem. Uh, Walsh per J's papers in French. So, I don't know many other places you can see the theorem other than right there. So, uh, and my slides are now gone. Oh, there it is. Good. Okay. So, now that I've said lots and lots of uh, math that is very terse and <laughs> mind boggling, if the question and how to, you know, go about showing the current, current numbers, you know, hopefully you go, okay, well, it involves elliptic curves, modular forms, and black magic, you're right. If you go elliptic curves, that sounds cool. Modular forms, okay. I really want to know about theorem that the book won't even write down. Even better. So um, even, even better. Um, but the other interesting thing about this, um, and the reason I was interested in the concurrent number problem to begin with, is actually because the techniques in it can be applied to other questions. Um, so using that, um, the method to get a partial result, you can actually use that to go, okay, what square free integers are there non-trivial solutions to the cubic Fermat equation in co-joined square root D? Same approach um, to it, you know, you can certainly find examples in which non-trivial solutions exist. Uh, non-trivial solutions being not all zero, not one and zero, not one, zero and one, you know, the boring ones that everything has. Um, but so you, you know that for certain Ds, those certainly exist. And you can use the same techniques to get a result that looks very similar to tunnels, um, where you have these weird uh, equalities, which have, uh, in this case, a much more annoying criteria. So it's no longer broken down to even or odd, but rather divisible by three, or not divisible by three. Oh, and positive, and then the negative versions. Uh, these equations are actually related to the elliptic curve in very strange ways. Uh, I believe actually the twists of the elliptic curve. So, um, but other questions can use tunnels um, argument and structure to do that. So that's kind of the more interesting thing um, as well is you get partial results. And the very nice thing about this is, okay, uh, so one, we have those equations to check, but you can also just directly check the, uh, the rank of the L functions and do this in a very systematic way. So you can produce tables very rapidly to figure out what values would have a uh, congruent num what values are congruent numbers or in cubic Fermat case, um, which ones have non-trivial solutions. And I'm sure lots and lots of other questions can be tackled in a very similar way. So hopefully this will uh, inspire you to go find a question that does that. Uh, if you want to know more about how to prove this in not just like general tools that are used uh, very conversationally, but rather explicitly, um, there's Koblet's book, which I'm sure you can find a copy of, or um, 
you can certainly go Google uh, my master's thesis from Wake Forest, which might be a little bit more readable, but that's not going to be the congruent number problem, so it might be less interesting, kind of a toss up. But um, that will give you much more detail um, than is possible in, you know, a talk where I don't want to talk over undergrads or non number theorists. Anyway, uh, I will take questions if you have any. Looks like our speaker starts. Any questions? Yes, we got a question. Can you hear me okay? I think so. Yeah, so um, I just had a uh, sort of a trivial question. So in one of the slides, you mentioned an equality that is of concern between L of E comma S and L of F of Z comma S. Uh, let me scroll back. Oh, here? Yeah, the last one, yeah. So mm -hmm. I see that uh, both of them are infinite series. So yes. uh, I mean, since convert numbers are natural numbers and very well defined, how would you define that equality? Like is it a, like approaching the same limit equality or term by term comparison? They they approach the same they they actually do produce the same value. Oh okay. um, yeah. So if you're talking about a general infinite series, um, you have certainly converges, and then you also have the horrible part about uh, infinite series that no one likes to talk about, which is for certain series you can actually produce whatever real number you'd like. This will converge to the same value, um, so there's no rearrangement worries. Um, which is why you're able to just work with um, the the L function of the modular form. Got it. Thanks. Other questions? So I had to step away from the computer for a second. You might have actually explained this, but I've never like handled elliptical curves before. I've never done any reading into that sort of stuff. So if you were to give like a quick like informal description of what an elliptic curve is. Like, how would you describe it? So elliptic curves are, well, I mean, it, it, it always depends for everything, how you want to view them. So just for a uh, non-elliptic curve moment, um, most like, you know, I, I have uh, friends who, you know, had the same advisor as I did at Wake Forest and none of us know what the other one did or tools they use. So, and we all work with the same general structures. So for my, uh, my modular forms um, idea is, I go ask a computer, I go do Sturm's theorem and go, oh, this is zero by playing with the coefficients so I get something that works. So it, it completely does depend um, on what aspect you want to deal with it. So for elliptic curves, um, you can view them like you know essentially as just algebraic objects. Um, you can kind of also view them as topological objects since they're essentially just torses. But um, I, I, from my understanding, top, uh, topology is a bad word in the department, so I won't say more on that. But you, you can, and not only can you view them as you know this algebraic group law that I. Um, hand waved at, but if you really, really hate life, you can actually derive the algebraic formulas for that group law. And, you know, at least for a very specific elliptic curve family and just do those directly. Um, so you can just do a lot of brute force arithmetic and, you know, make this work out for a given elliptic curve. Um, I'm going to hesitate and not say in general, um, but certainly for like, you know, um, the, the ENs or the um, ones I dealt with, um, with from Oz Cubic, uh, you can view them completely in general. Um, and I, I think if you're 
and I think if you're interested in, um, if you're a researcher interested in like high ranks, I think that's the current hot topic. It's either high rank or low rank. I always, I always get confused on which one is, you know, the thing at the moment for each thing because it always flips. But um, I think that becomes more analytic in nature. So <laughs> it, it really depends on how you want to view them, unfortunately. Um, but like I said, it's just an abelian group. And once you know it's an abelian group, you kind of just run, run at them. Um, so for instance, uh, you can make the problems more complicated because as I mentioned over here with Mazur's theorem, um, we know we have an object with uh, four, uh, a, a, a subgroup of four elements. And with that, in, in Tunnel's theorem, I believe they take a great deal of care to show that it's not divisible by six. I, I, if I remember right, they take a great deal of care, but you're like, well, if I know the size is four, Celo theorem. Um, so, and I think the hatred of how much arithmetic you can force yourself to do also might depend on the curve because my advisor tried having me do the similar thing and after two weeks and finally in algebra, he goes, oh yeah, Celo theorems are a thing. I'm like, I know there's no group, uh, no element of order two. Celo, I'm done. So, um, yeah. View in terms of arithmetic, view in terms of just general algebra. Okay. Long winded for nothing. So, I have a question. Can you go back to that picture of the elliptic curve? Yes. So, I guess I've got two questions. So, P1 plus P2 is P4, correct? Yep. Mm -hmm. P2 was directly above P1. Does that mean that P2 and P1 are negative to each other? Okay, so if P1 and P2 are directly above each other, their third point of intersection is going to be infinity. So that means that they are going to be inverses, so they are negatives of each other. Um, the point of infinity, I, I didn't spell this out for, um, so if you do want to view this as a, uh, a billion group, you certainly need to know what your identity is. The identity is just a point at infinity. So for P4 and P3, since they're, you know, again, just on the same vertical line, the point of infinity is up there. If I had P1 and another point here, is the point directly above them. Um, this is, this can also be view, viewed as projective space, which is why that's a little screwy. So uh, another way to view elliptic curves. Uh, and I think you said you had another question, Jim? Uh, well, maybe. Uh, actually, this question might occur to other people. I think I've worked it out, though. So on this diagram, what's P1 plus P4? Uh, P1 plus P4. Uh, I think it's this point. Because okay. it looks like if I intersect these lines, I would hit here and then reflect up to here. So I think it should be that point. Okay, gotcha. Perfect. Is that what you thought it was? Yeah. Okay. I was worried. That, oh, and if you want to know fun facts of the day, this portion of the elliptic curve, if it exists on a given elliptic curve, is called an egg. Technical terms. Well, scripted. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, let's thank our speaker again. Thanks, Mark. You all have a good weekend. Thank you for coming out there in Etherland. Thank you for coming here. Killian uh, will be speaking next week. So hold on to your hats for that one. Everybody have a safe and fun weekend. Thank you, too. <clears throat>